everyone here, everyone on the stream, definitely uh, after you watch this, uh, start working on it now. As you know, the first submission deadline is October 12th. So that means that you at least need to implement a baseline model, which is one of the biggest steps um, in the assignment. And then after that, you're going to need to give yourself a lot of time to experiment and tune um, because it's not uh, necessarily a, qu a quick process and you want to have enough time. So if, once my clicker works, okay. Okay, that's working out. All right, so briefly, here's today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna touch on the problem. We're gonna touch on, we're gonna touch on some data pre-processing techniques. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, some model architectures that you guys can start out with and, and some ones that you can experiment with down the line. And then we're also gonna talk about the learning objective as, as well as, as some other losses uh, that you, you, you can think about using. Um, all right, so let's talk about the problem statement. Um, so really what we're doing here is we're using transfer learning um, initially to design a system uh, for speaker verification. And I, I say transfer learning because as you guys have probably already seen, the first task that you're gonna do is implement an M -way class, uh, a network for M-way classification of speakers. But this is not necessarily the task at hand. Um, so what we're, what we're really trying to do is, is we're trying to train a convolutional neural network to extract and learn features that are useful for speech verification, um, which itself is distinct from identification. Um, so given these two embeddings that we, that we learn, so given a pair of them from two different utterances, we need to c come up with some kind of similarity metric, um, usually based on the distance um, between the, the, the two vectors given some distance function. All right, so here's a rough outline of the general approach. Two speaker log spectrograms, um, generally variable length. Um, currently, right here, we're assuming that you've already trained this convolutional neural network, and it, it, it's gonna produce a feature embedding, and we're gonna use some kind of distance, distance metric. This could even just be Euclidean distance um, between the two vectors. And this, this should give up, uh, for well-trained feature embeddings, this should give us a, uh, a good metric of similarity. All right, so one thing that we're talking about uh, in this assignment that we haven't really talked about before is uh, open set versus closed set uh, problems. So generally, what we've been doing so far in the, in the course is closed set problems, where you have a training set, and even though uh, the data uh, is different in the training set, we believe that it is generally distributed the same way as the test data. And we definitely assume that they're the same uh, classes represented in the, in the test set as there are in the, in the, in the training or, or evaluation set. Here, that's not necessarily so. Here, what we're doing is we're learning a data set of a fixed number of speakers, and then we're going to do verification on a data set that may be, that is likely disjoint from our, our, our training set. So the, the speakers that you could be testing on are not necessarily ones that you've trained on before. So you need, so the goal is to learn uh, fe features that are general enough such that they're not fitting necessarily to the um, uh, inconsistencies of a specific speaker. So here's a diagram of the problem. Um, it, it also goes over the classification versus the metric learning problem. Um, but we're, here, we're gonna talk about a, a bit about the problem of identification and the problem of verification. So the problem of identification, in, in, in this case, is a uh, facial recognition task, but it's, it's, it's very similar, right? So the idea is that in identification, given a face, who is it? Um, this is generally a closed set task, right? You, you have a thousand known, known speakers and we need to figure out who it is. Um, in, ver in verification, all, we, all we, we need to say is, are two speakers the same? Um, oh, and other ways that identification is done is if you have some sort of um, gallery of faces that you know, and, and then you can use some sort of verification to run your test image through the gallery and see whether, whether they're the same or not, and then try to identify the face that way. But that, that falls much more in the verification side of things. 
Um, so today we're really just, just going to focus on verification. So in the case of facial recognition problem, we have the training set. Did it just go on? Yeah. <laughs> so in the case of the facial recognition problem, we have our training set. Now there are two ways we can uh, look at the problem. It can be a closed set or an open set face recognition problem. In the case of the closed set problem, what we're looking at is, uh, so in this case, the identities all appear in our training set. And also, while we're doing verification, we are predicting the label. And uh, so that's how we're doing. So we're predicting the label. So we are training our set so that each face belongs to a particular ID. And during the verification phase, what's happening is we are actually giving a face and we're asking our network to predict the ID. So in this case, and if we're giving two faces, then we compare the IDs of both the faces. And then if we belong to the same ID, then we say they're the same person or not. So in this case, it's a classification problem where we're learning features of the data. Whereas in the case of an open set recognition problem, yes. Okay, yeah. Ah, oh, what happened now? What's going on? So. Okay. okay, so in the case of the open set face recognition problem, here are the identities do not appear in the training set. We're assuming, so we, it's not like the training set is completely exhaustive for all our training, our training IDs. So what happens is when we are training a uh, network, we are actually running a feature extractor where we extract features from each of these faces. And in the case of the uh, verification phase, what we are doing is we are actually um, seeing if two faces are passed into our feature extractor, we're seeing how close these two features are. And we have a threshold. So if these features are very close, then we consider them to be the same. Whereas if they're not, we don't, it's not the same. So in this case, it's more like a, we're learning a margin. We're learning how far away can features be considered to be not considered the same identity. So that's where we get into the identification and verification phase. So there are two ways of approaching the, uh, there are two ways of solving a problem. Where we're doing identification or verification. In identification, we are running a classification sort of a problem. Exactly in homework one part two, what you guys did was an identification problem. In the case of verification, we are doing a one to n matching, where you pick up a sample and then you find the closest sample among n other samples. But in this homework, what you will be doing is a one to one matching, where given two samples, you will verify if they belong to the same speaker or not. Now let's get into transfer learning. Okay. Oh. Okay, it's back. Yeah. So for transfer learning, the whole point is it's basically a machine learning method where a model developed for another task is being used as a starting point for the model for the second task. There are two main approaches which we will use. Uh, uh, two main approaches for transfer learning, which is the developed model and the pre-trained model. So in the developed model approach, we select a source task. And we develop the source model, and we reuse the model. So we start whatever model we had previously developed is used as a starting point for the second task, and then we further tune it. For example, in the pre-trained approach, what we do is we select a model which is already pre-trained. For example, some of the most popular pre-trained models are the ResNet 50s and the ResNet, uh, the ResNet models, which are actually pre-trained on ImageNet data. And then we reuse that model, but we fine-tune them further on the model. So what you can do is probably people just fine-tune the last few layers to make it more specific to their classification task than what's currently uh, than the ImageNet task. So in the diagram, as you can see, we have an old classifier, then we extract the pre-trained, and then we add, add, have a new classifier. So that's the concept of transfer learning, where you're using something which was previously learned and using it for a new task. Now for this homework, how do we all tie everything together from what we had covered? So transfer learn, we are going to use transfer learning for this task of speaker verification. And we will follow the developed model approach. If you remember, that was we first train a model for our own task, 
for what task one, and then we fine tune it for task two. So that for our model one would be training a convolution network to perform an n-way speaker identification. We have some speaker IDs in our data set, right? So using that, we'll perform a convolution network. I mean, we perform a classification task. After that, we extract the intermediate representations of these speaker recordings. And then, after we extract these intermediate rep representations, we verify if these two representations belong to the same speaker. But, so, that's just not enough. We have to kind of fine-tune the network to learn the features better, to learn more discriminative features. Because we want, it's not only a class identification task, it's a verification task, as we had mentioned previously. So how do we go about speaker verification? So in this case, given our recording is a log spectrum, we pass it the CNN, we have the embedding layer before the classification layer, and then we get the n-class probabilities. Uh, so we use a cross-entropy cross ob objective, and it's applied per sample, as we had previously. I mean, that's kind of standard how we do it I mean, in the previous homeworks. How are we evaluating your network? So how are we evaluating this verification task? So we're using the equal error rate. So it's usually for binary classification problems. Where we pre so we need a point where your false positive rate is equal to your true positive rate. So that's when we, that's basically our ER point, according to the graph, if you see. So this is your uh, pre precision by recall graph, and there's an area under the curve. So we need the point where both of them are equal is known as the ER point. So that's the values you see. So in your homework, if you get a value of 0.5, that's absolutely random, because you'll see it's somewhere in the middle, right? So you need a better, so the higher your ER, I mean, the lower your ER, the better it is. All right. Now, what about your data? So the first pro thing, first approach towards solving any problem is how does your data look? So we have multiple recordings of different lengths. And in this case, we have a plot a histogram. And we can see the average length is around 9,700 uh, um, features in each recording length. And as the chunks increase, we see the number of speakers also increase. So what I would suggest is start with chunk one, get a model up and running, and be, after that it's just adding more chunks to your data and let, letting it learn better, right? So as this data set is extremely huge, as you guys see, it was huger before. So we actually tried to reduce it slightly by uh, using the voice activity detection. So what it does is it, create, it finds if there's a presence or absence of human speech. So the whole idea behind using the voice activity detection is that we want to remove parts which have no speech or a silent parts, because that kind of reduces our data set to a slightly, you know, lower, uh, slightly lower size. But it's still, I think, around 18, 20 GB, if I'm not wrong, right? And uh, uh, so the, this is the whole process, where at the end, we apply a classification rule where we are based on a threshold where we identify if it's a silence or if it's a speaker speaking. Right? And also, one more point which we did was we reduced, um, so we have represented this data as 16-bit floats. So that way, we are again, from instead of a float 64 or 32, we have half the data side using by reducing the representation size. Now, as we know, it's all variable lens, so how do we handle it? Now, there are various ways where we can handle it, and using your previous data set statistics, you need to f figure out a fixed length, which you think is most appropriate uh, based on the previous numbers which I had shown earlier. So there are ways you can do it where you slice off a fixed length from the utterance, uh, you know, just from the beginning, or you can pick up a random point in the middle of the utterance and slice it off. And if your utterance length, if your slicing off is larger than your utterance length, then you repeat the utterance. So, can I do it here? Watch the cable, please. Yeah. Okay. So if this is your utterance, and at the moment you, uh, and this is of like 20, and you have decided to slice off a length of 25. So what you do is, for the rest 25, you repeat this 5 over here, right? So you complete, continues, continue wrapping your data. So why this works in this task, but not in the previous other task, is because this is an identification task. We are not verifying what phonemes the speaker is speaking. We just want to learn features of the speaker itself. So that's why this, this works for this, uh, for this speaker identification problem itself. 
And you can use the np.pad function, which will help you wrap it easy, which will help, help you wrap your data easily. Now let's get into, yeah? So if you pad it with zeros, it becomes a silence. You can consider it as a silence thing. And you're kind of not giving more information. You're losing information. So if, if you had sliced off, like, OK, let's assume again. So this thing is 25. And your slice points are 20, right? But your random point, which you've decided, is 20. So you have 40 here. I mean, sorry, you pad it more, so you, right? So that's your whole new utterance, which is all zeros. But if you had padded it from here, you have more information for the network to learn. So that's the reason we don't pad it with zeros, but it's more sensible to wrap it with the data itself. Right? Um, another tip is, um, so we have the train load function on, in your utils.py. Don't load your data on your init function of your data loader, OK, if you're using the data loader. Load it outside and then pass it as a parameter, because I've noticed that some, you get memory issues very quickly due to that. As you try a, yeah? Sorry, I didn't get you. Mm -hmm. Is that before we ever give it to the convolutional network? Uh, so it's before you give it to the convolution network. Even while in your testing phase, when you're given two samples, you need to sample two utterances from both your speakers and then pass it into the convolution neural net for getting, extracting the speaker embeddings. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm mean, training it too for the first time. I mean, it, it works both ways because what you train it with, you need to even verify it with, right? Yeah. So when you're training this, do you want to randomly slice it each time you go through a data set? Is there a point in like, slicing it differently every time you go through a call? No. no. I mean, slicing differently? So Wait. let's say you go through the entire data set once. So mm -hmm. is there a point in, because you are slicing it randomly from the point, is there a point to randomly slice it again? Yeah. Then if, if you randomly slice, if you pick a single order at the beginning, mm -hmm. you do that per epic. That's the same thing as having a fixed data set where you just arbitrarily pick a starting point. Yeah, so you do so, so it is, you slice it. If you do it again, so you get different starting points. Okay. So you, the network learns more features better, right? Next time, when you go through again. Keep random. So what I would say is in your get item or something like that, just keep a random function which generally slices data. Oh, I see. So you feed the interesting in the first time. When you look at get item, you do slice it. I mean, that's just a way to, many, do, many, it, many but, ways to do it, but yeah, there are better, more efficient ways. So now let's get into the network architectures itself. So this is still, we are on the classification task. We are on the first model, right? So we have to train our CNN. So there's, uh, uh, PyTorch gives us 1D convolutions and 2D convolutions. If you're using a 1D convolution, you set the number of channels as 64, which is your feature size. And while, you're, and you need, while average pooling, you need to average across the time dimension. Make sure you do that, otherwise you get little messed up results. And also, you achieve low ER, around 24 in the first few epochs. So a better way to do this would be 2D convolutions, where in this case, so as we had learned previously in our class, the 2D convolution is used basically on an RGB image. right? So that's why we consider three channels. But in this case, we are using speech utterances, which are basically a monochrome 2D image. So the number of channels we use is just one in this case. One more point about convolution 1D is it's as good as use, doing a time delay network, uh, convolving over time delay networks as we had met, as we had learned it in class previously. So in a 2D convolution, we set each of the we set the number of channels to one, and while average pooling, so at the end you need to pass it through your MLPs right to extract your embedding. So you need to average pool twice. Once across the dimensions and then across the features, right? You'll know. When you implement it, you'll know. And also, you should achieve higher ERs in this case. So why does so convolution 2Ds do work better than 1D? Well, the reason is that you're convolving not only over time, but you're also convolving over the features, 
Whereas in the previous case, you're not doing that. You're just convolving over time, right? And another memory optimization technique is to use tapering, where layers near the input can have higher filter sizes and larger strides, and you can reduce the filter sizes and strides as the network goes deeper. But make sure you handle your padding while you're doing this, otherwise you'll get errors, right? So this optimization technique is... Uh, I meant lower, I'll correct that, yeah. So with these, these techniques where you can use, an, so these are actually there in a lot of popular website, uh, popular convolution architectures, which we will see next. So one of the first ones which came up was the AlexNet, where they were the first ones to use ReLU and dropouts instead of TANHs. So that's why they were really popular, but it's 2012, it's one of the, it's when the network started, the convolution network started getting deeper, right? Followed by that, there was VGGNet, which was deeper than the AlexNet, right? And they used fully connected layers at the end. That was also some, that was something which VGGNet brought to the table. So the thing is, as these networks get deeper, what happens is your accuracy will, uh, your error rate will keep decreasing, but then it'll stagnate, and after a while, it starts increasing. So you don't want that to happen. So just having a deeper or a larger network doesn't, I mean, if you keep training it, it does not always help. So that's where we, that's where people came up with ResNet. So ResNets are these, uh, where they have res are like these networks where you have skip connections. So what you do is you take the input of a previous layer and you fast forward it to a deeper layer below, right? So that's, and, it, and we use an identity function. Most cases it's an additive identity function where we add the input of the previous layer, uh, from the previous layer, and the current input from the stack neural layers, as explained here. So I'll uh, do put out the paper link with the slide, so you guys can refer to the paper for more further details uh, on, on what, are the, what is the exact, so there are multiple nets in the rest of the architectures, like 50, 101, so the layers just get deeper, right? But, at, but they could get deeper networks, though only because of the fact, because of these residual skip, skip, skip connections, and um, and they, and they and they achieve good results with this uh, ResNet too. An extension of ResNet are dense nets, where instead of using an uh, identity function, we, they are actually concatenating outputs from the previous layers, right? So and because of the uh, and they also encourage feature reuse and they, and and it's and these networks are usually more narrower, okay? I'll also give out the paper to this. You can check out the architecture and you can implement it for your homework. So these are some of the networks which I would say is a good start on how you want to do your homework and then tune it further. Uh, and you can, I'll, you'll find a lot of literature online which will help you with implementing them too. Okay, I'll give it over to Ryan now for the next step. Start the okay. stream, so like, this is this is a good time. So I'll, yeah, just, I'll just take a break. Okay. Okay. Can you post on Piazza? Yeah. In the meantime, does anyone here have any quick questions about questions about anything else or? You restarted it. All right. I will get back to that question. Well, actually, I'll I'll, I'll just say it on the stream. Um, so we have a question about how do you average pool over the time dimension? Well, it's just mean, right? So the idea is that, like, you, you in, in, at least in PyTorch, you'll just have to take take the mean over over the correct axes of the tensor. Um, so, yeah. All right. So now we're kind of going. Uh, let's just we're going to step back a little bit. Um, let's recap what we went through. We went through this, the speaker verification problem. We talked a little bit about using classification for verification, uh, using transfer learning. Uh, we, we talked about some practical data considerations in this task, uh, convolutional nets for feature learning, um, as well as some uh, useful archite ar architectures. All right, so next, we're gonna revisit classification for verification. Why does it work? Uh, why can we get away with this? Um, we're gonna talk about how we can actually explicitly optimize 
for more discriminative features. Um, and then we're going to think about margins a little bit. And then we're going to go over some other uh, losses that, that deal with optimizing uh, for these discriminative features. And then lastly, we're going to touch on something called Angular Softmax, which is a really interesting uh, variant of, of, of the Softmax uh, loss with a uh, neat geometric interpretation. All right, so back to the slide that we, that we had before, um, speaker, verification, uh, speaker classification, but for verification. Um, so we're going to utilize the activations of the second to last layer. This is arbitrary. Um, you know, sort of we have this intuitive idea that like um, the, this is the, the nearest uh, point in the network like, that like we assume that, that a neural network builds uh, features in, 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 in a hierarchy towards higher level features. So we want to use the highest level features um, that are not just being used for the classification task. Um, and then we're going to estimate the similarity between the speech samples uh, by using the inverse distance uh, between these embeddings. You can, you know, pick what distance metric makes you happy or what works best. All right, so this is a slide that we went over in a previous lecture. Um, and it's, it's true that, like, deep neural networks can learn really meaningful features um, as they, uh, you know, to, to, to do the task at hand. Um, so, for example, you can see in this left image here um, how even though it's achieved the classification task well, the, uh, the class labels that it assigns um, the, the, the next highest probability are, act are usually very well related, you know, semantically to the class that it's classifying, right? So, like, um, this leopard, um, you know, leopard, jaguar, cheetah, snow cat, and so that, that's in classification that we can see, see that, that it has, has some good understanding of the, uh, of the features. But even more interesting, and this sort of motivates our use of the second to last layer as, as an embedding feature vector. Um, and this shows that if we tear off the uh, activity, um, the embedding, um, after a feed forward on the first image in the left column, and then we do, do that for the, whole, for the whole data set, and then we try, we try to cluster. We, these are the nearest neighbors to that vector in, in Euclidean space. Um, so that's pretty, pretty interesting. So now that, now that we can say that we can learn, we can use cl classification um, to learn useful features that, that, um, um, uh, that are in line with the separability learned in classification. So remember that classification purely requires the separate ability of different, uh, of samples from different classes. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, you are maximizing interclass distance or minimizing intraclass distance. And when it comes to verification, um, the goal is not just to separate, but we really want to have discriminative features. Um, and these are features that, that will really, really, uh, like, um, don't want to say discriminate. That's not going to work too well. But like, they want to create a uh, measurable to like, like you make distance useful uh, for telling uh, multiple classes apart. So we need to define a measure of distance. Most often, we're going to uh, consider Euclidean distance. All right, center loss. Um, so what if we define a criterion that promotes minimal intraclass distance, um, but just but on the same time maintaining interclass separability, but we're not necessarily going to explicitly promote that. So what we do is um, for each class, I believe this is MNIST. Yeah, this, this is MNIST here. Um, for, for for each class, uh, go through and uh, for all the examples, find a, a class center at every iteration, and then try to pull the embedding. The, this is the xi here, the feature vector, towards that class center. Um, and uh, yeah, so obviously we're assuming Euclidean distance here, trying to minimize that um, between each sample in the same class. Uh, this is, this is a, a yi and uh, the embedding vector. And often this will be a joint objective where ls is just your normal softmax cross entropy loss. I'm calling it softmax loss 
That's sort of just a general term used to like uh, consider the last layer the or the classification layer, the softmax transformation, and then the cross entropy objective. But I'm just going to call it softmax loss. Um, so you can use it as a joint objective. Um, often, though, you will use it to further fine tune your network. So you, you will train on classification and then at the end ap uh, apply center loss. OK. But this is not to, we can be a little bit more explicit about um, pursuing um, interclass separability. So now what we're going to try to do is maintain a, a margin between um, embeddings of different classes. So in, in contrastive loss, what we're going to do is for every pair of training instances, try to push the samples for intra-class uh, embeddings together and maintain some margin M between uh, in, in, inter-class ones. So the idea of the, mar of the margin here is that if, if, if two samples of different classes, if, if their distance is less than this margin, we want to penalize that. But if, if, they are, uh, greater, if their distance is greater than, than M, then, then we don't penalize it in this objective. Um, and so you, you, you can see in this objective here, it looks really fancy. But all it's saying is that if the class labels are the same, um, minimize the square distance. Um, otherwise, if they're, not, if they're not, not the same class, then we take the max here. So you, you can see if this d distance is uh, greater than M, um, then we're not going to penalize. If we're less than M, um, then we're going try to try to try to push it away. Um, so this is generally really only really useful for, for, for fine tuning uh, fine tuning because it's not an information rich criterion. You you, you can think about it think about it as for each sample uh, joint sample it's going to be a 0.5 it, if the sets balance between positive and, and negative pairs then it's going to be a 0.5 probability. Um, so log of one over that probability is one, and log base two, so that's one bit of information um, per sample pair. And it, t it turns out that it's a bit tricky to balance sample pairs and also choose this margin. Um, it's especially if um, the, the, the vectors are like n not normalized, it's really, it's really hard to like think about what, what metric to pick or like what margin to pick. Um, and then a, a practical consideration is like, how do you actually do this? Um, you know, how, how do you get two embeddings at once and then um, consider each of their contributions? Or like, 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 how do you propagate gradients back so that way the samples are pushed away or pushed together as this objective uh, says? So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to have something that's generally called a Siamese network. Um, so a Siamese network is really just two networks with shared parameters, um, where you think about it as just feeding through one network twice producing two embeddings, and then applying this objective, and then backpropagating that error. OK, so another interesting idea is called triplet loss. Um, now, not just two, but we're going to have three uh, shared parameter networks. Um, and with them, now we're going to have three samples. And the three samples we're going to call the anchor, the, ne the, neg the negative example, and the positive example. And this is very much motiv motivated by nearest neighbor classification, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And you know, the, the key idea here is that we want the speaker em em embedding for a given speaker to be um, closer to all the embeddings of that same speaker than it is to any uh, embeddings from any other speaker. Um, so, so it's really, uh, we, we want a nearest neighbor scenario. Um, so the goal here is we're going to uh, share parameters among three networks. And um, then you can see in, the, in, in this diagram here, or basically as I described, that that's what the objective is going to, going to try to do. If you're interested in implementing this, the paper is linked. Um, and you, you can follow it and see the exact criterion. Yeah? What's the difference between this and center loss? Um, center loss feels like you're trying to like move the centers together in a, in a kind of similar idea. Like you're, you're trying to move them away. It's a, it's a similar idea, but, but it ends up being mathematically different. Um, because like here, here with center loss, every um, iteration, you then pick a center, and you, and you try to cluster the points around, around that center. Whereas um, in triplet loss, this is a per sample 
objective here. We're actually in, in, in individually trying to push together the embeddings of, positive, of, the, of the positive class with the anchor and then push it away from the negative class. Um, triplet loss ends up working. It's really hard to give empirical results because it, it depends what domain that you're working in. But triplet loss can work really, really well if you can sample triplets in an intelligent manner. This is called sample mining. Um, a lot of times you can get imbalance and the thing can really fall apart. So um, the only downside of, of the big downside of triple loss is the engineering you need to do to get the, to, to get the sample mining correct. Um, and plus just overhead of uh, sam you know, s s sampling, balancing triplets, and then actually uh, loading them in, having three sets of, you know, having the parameters, you know, having, having three sets of shared weights. So those things, th things are a bit tricky. But this is definitely s something, something to try. Again, um, light contrastive loss. This is also for fine tuning. Don't use this as your initial ob objective because you will see very minimal benefit, uh, mi minimal learning in the beginning. All right, so we're going to step back again and we're going to talk about something that, that you've seen a lot. Um, and this is softmax loss, which I said before, we're just going to use that word to describe the, uh, the last layer parameters, the softmax operator, and then the cross, cross entropy loss. Um, so f for simplicity here, we're going to simply assume a binary classification case. Um, so the idea is that we have two uh, weight vectors that make up the weight matrix. Um, W1, um, the uh, W1 uh, transpose X plus B1 is the first unit um, output. W2 uh, transpose X plus B2 is the second unit output. Um, and with the softmax formulation, this is simply just the probability of class one um, is, is given at the top, and the probability of class two is given here. And if we set these two terms equal, right, this is, this is gonna, gonna be the point where uh, the, the percentage that we believe it's either class is, is 0.5. So this is what we're gonna call the decision boundary. And when you solve for everything, this is what you get. It's pretty, um, pretty simple uh, formulation. All right, so now we're gonna talk about this idea of angular softmax loss. Um, so one of, the, one, of the really, one of the things that we don't get with softmax is really an in, in, in interpretation uh, of, uh, of how it uh, learns uh, the placement of features in space. So what if we can combine the idea of Euclidean margin constraint, which we saw in um, contrastive loss, um, with softmax loss. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to formulate um, an angular interpretation of softmax and project it onto a hypersphere, and we're going to and we can use some really interesting uh, geometric reasoning. Um, so so now with this, there's no need for sample mining, um, and the the learned features in a special case are very inter interpretable, and, and you can obviously see that they're d d discriminative. All right, so let's just go through sort of uh, understanding angular softmax. So this is, this is what we had before, is the, the decision boundary when the, uh, so still, still the binary case um, when the class probabilities are the same. Um, and from your uh, favorite intro calculus or like geometry class, um, we, we can easily uh, it, uh, um, arrive at this. And, but theta i is, is, is gonna be the angle between the weight and the feature vector, so x and uh, w i. And if we assume um, that w is, i is a unit vector and um, that the bias are, are zeroed, the decision boundary becomes um, the cosine of the angle between x and the um, uh, w1 is equal to the cosine of theta2, which is the angle between w and theta2. So this is, this is bi angle bisection. So what, what's cool about this is that x drops out. There's no real consideration about x here because um, so now all we're saying is in, in, in this special condition, the decision boundary is an angle bisector of the uh, two uh, weight vectors. So you, you, you actually see it here. So this is 
We're not actually at Angular Softmax yet. We're getting there. This is what's what the paper authors call the modified um, Softmax loss. Uh, so this is the Angular in interpretation here. And, and you can see that the decision boundary, the learned decision boundary on this data set actually lies at the angle bisector of W1, W2. Um, and the weight vectors themselves don't necessarily have to be unit vectors, and the biases don't necessarily have to be zero, but the geometric reasoning is not as clean. So for now, we're just, we're just going to assume that. And um, when you use that identity and uh, plug it into the softmax formulation and apply cross-entropy loss on it, this is what you end up getting here, uh, where theta ji um, is, uh, assumes that we're talking about the angle between the weight vector j and uh, the feature vector i. So, yeah. All right. But now what we can do, which we couldn't do with the, um, now we have a sense of like uh, um, the space in which we can impose a discriminatory constraint. Uh, before in of loss, we can just use some kind of distance metric. But now we can imply a discriminative constraint based on the angle um, between classes. So we're actually going to add a margin, m, cosine m of uh, theta. And what this tells us now is that let's just, so this, this top equation is for the general multi-class case. That's kind of hard to think about, but we can think about it in the binary class case here. Um, so as we said before, theta one, and between weight vector one and feature vector um, uh, theta two, angle between uh, weight vector two and the feature vector. So Cosine m is, is, the, is the equivalent of saying that theta 2 divided by m, in order to correctly classify type 1, say that, say that 1 is the correct label, and uh, we need to have uh, the weight vector uh, such that theta 1 um, needs to be less than theta 2 over m in order to be correctly classified. Um, and the reverse is true for the, for the other class. So what this comes out to here is this nice geometric interpretation. So you can just see the Euclidean margin loss um, in a two-dimensional manifold and a three-dimensional manifold. Um, this is the modified softmax loss. You can see that there's just a, a clear decision boundary at the angle bisector. But for the angular softmax loss, now, now you can see in order for, the, for it to be clearly classified, you have to be greater than the margin uh, m. Like, uh, sorry, your angle has to be less. Um, than at m over theta, m over theta, sorry, theta over m, and um, so so now you can see how it's um, this loss will push your feature representation uh, um, into these little um, angular regions, um, and it's we it's 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 necessarily more discriminative because I can go back and. You, you can see this here, how if you don't have a margin here, um, yes, you may get separability in, with this interpretation, but you're not going to necessarily promote um, interclass uh, separation. So I would highly recommend um, going and trying to implement Angular softmax loss. Um, another benefit is that it, you, you get to use it during the classification phase, which is much more information rich. So you can use this straight off the bat. This is not necessarily a fine tuning technique. So it's, it's, it's sort of like one and done. You know, you, you don't need to have the complexity of sample mining um, and then doing a classification training first and then, at, and then fine tuning. It, just use this. Um, all right. What do you think? Are there any questions? We can definitely go through some questions. We definitely have to have some more time. Uh, we're done with our slides for now, but um, is there anyone on Piazza? Um, no. No, okay. So when you say like implement this, are you saying go back to the previous slide and implement that map in your criterion object? Yeah, but there are some things that you're going to have to consider. Um, so for example, this. Um, this uh, term here, the cosine of um, m theta y i um, i, that you'll have to, it's the domain um, 
is what, from like zero to like theta over m. So you're going to need to like transform that into some monotonically decreasing function that shares uh, the, the domain of cosine uh, of, of m theta between um, zero and the point at which it recycles. So they, in the paper, they list a, uh, a, another function you can use. Yes, but effectively it is implementing this with a couple changes and a couple more considerations. So the paper is the paper pretty descriptive in terms of very descriptive, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, I believe it is one of these archive links here. Uh, and the and the paper is not actually called Angular Softmax. Um, it's it's a paper about um, face verification. Sure. Yeah, so I, I, I'm merely just uh, doing the logic w with two classes here. Um, I don't have a good visualization of the multi-class case. There is one in, in the paper, but you, you can imagine um, lots of these little um, arcs um, of multiple classes here. But th this, this equation up top is the equation for multiple classes. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, I mean, you you, you sum over the different classes. Right. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Uh, people on live stream, try to if you, if you can post on Piazza in the next two minutes, we, we can answer. Otherwise, we'll uh, call it a day. And uh, I'll I'll be holding office hours tomorrow from two to three. Um, so if anyone has any questions or wants to go over part two. Uh, I'll be there in uh, LTI.